Kennedy is shocked and angry. But while he and his advisors grope for the appropriate response, it's decided that he will say nothing publicly, that he will adhere to his previously planned schedule as strictly as he can. The man in charge of that is Special Assistant Dave Powers. The first appointment was uh, the astronaut, uh, Walter Schirra, with his family. And the president, uh, oh, he was so happy. He loved meeting astronauts. There's a family gathering at the White House as the president receives astronaut Walter M. Schirra, Jr. and his family. I come into the over room and I see this great man. We'd met him before with Glenn and Shepard. We sat pulling up her little grubby fingers. She was five years old. The president had asked her, and he's sitting in his rocking chair, smiling very graciously. He's having a good time with us. So it, uh, it really amazed me when I found out what kind of crisis was really going on all up and down those halls. At 11.45 that morning, all the president's men, the best and the brightest, gather here in the cabinet room around John Kennedy. They are XCOM, the executive committee of the National Security Council. An extraordinary period of crisis management begins in secret. Assistant Secretary of Defense Roswell Gilpatrick. And I think the sense one got at that first meeting was that, uh, you know, we, the United States, had to move in. We had to do something about it. At this first meeting, Bobby Kennedy, I now know how Tojo felt when he was planning Pearl Harbor. The group will continue to meet, its existence and concerns still secret. It's D-Day at Candlestick. Six months of baseball now spirals to a climax in just one game. The only missile of concern that day to the American people was a horsehide rocket intercepted by Bobby Richardson in the bottom of the ninth. And instead of the Giants beating the Yankees in the seventh game of the World Series, it was the other way around. At that moment, I was appearing in a play here in Paramus, New Jersey, at a theater run by Robert Ludlam. He went on to write thriller novels with, now it was back there in that mall somewhere. I don't remember the play, but I do remember listening to that World Series game backstage and grieving for Willie McCovey. Cuba was a long way away. Congressional elections are only three weeks away. Wednesday, October 17th. Kenneth Hayne for Democratic candidates. And in California, an ex-president is campaigning for an ex-vice president, Richard Nixon, who's running for governor. I'm for Nixon! I'm for Nixon! I'm for Nixon, too! California needs him, if Nixon is for you! Meanwhile, in Washington, the XCOM is meeting. The latest reconnaissance photos show that the missiles could be operational within a week. With the president gone, the discussion is heated, and the advisors divide into two camps. Bobby Kennedy, McNamara, and I were the only ones who wanted to keep the military response at its lowest level. Everybody else wanted a, an airstrike or a Joint Chiefs of Staff ultimately wanted just to go in and, you know, clean out the Castro regime. Dean Acheson, the former Secretary of State, was called in as an outside consultant. He recommended an airstrike against the missiles in Cuba. Okay. Uh, what will the uh, Soviets do in response? Oh, I know the Soviets pretty well, he said, from dealing with them over the years. I think they will then feel obligated to uh, launch an attack and knock out uh, our missiles in Turkey. And what will we then uh, do, uh, Mr. Secretary? Well, he said, under the uh, uh, NATO treaty, we would then be obligated to knock out uh, Soviet missile sites inside the Soviet Union. Well, what will they then do, Mr. Secretary? Well, he said, we hope by that time uh, cooler heads will prevail and... Uh, Fortunately, we did not take uh, his advice. And during these long days when the president and his men war, the cover must be kept. So Bobby Kennedy takes time from the crisis to attend the premiere of the big movie that fall, The Longest Day About War. That's not for the Alliierten, but also for the Deutschen. The longest day will be. The longest day. Thursday, October 18th, the XCOM looks at reports showing that the missiles in Cuba could carry half the Soviet Union's warheads and carry them right to us. Kennedy keeps a previously scheduled appointment to meet Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko. The president asked a direct question to Gromyko, said, uh, well, is it true that you're installing missiles in Cuba? Gromyko said, absolutely not. 
just flatly lied to the president. And, uh, which was interesting because also, it did not reveal to Gromyko that we knew that the missiles existed. As fortune would have it, the same day technology is threatening to blow us from the face of the Earth, technology is pushing the space race forward. The Ranger 5 moon probe is launched from Cape Canaveral. And the beginnings of life are honored when an American and a British scientist, Watson and Crick, take the Nobel Prize for discovering the key to genetics, DNA. And if you're watching ABC on that Thursday night, you see... Ozzy, Harriet, David, and Ricky. At 7.30, a happy family of four. At 8, another happy family of four. And at 8.30, a very happy... Life is pretty simple here, but this is television, not reality. Beaver is kind of the innocent, uh, viewing the world, not really understanding it. Wally is the, the middle character. He's kind of the bridge between the adult world and Beaver's innocent world. And then there's the adult saying, you know, this is what should be done. Sometimes they don't even do what they say, but they, they still say this is the way it should be done. What has to be done in the adult world of Washington is to keep the Cuban crisis secret. There were all kinds of cover stories to explain everything, even by somebody as high as McGeorge Bundy, who was the national security advisor urging us to believe that it was yet another Berlin crime. Yes, we, we are having trouble. There's something in Berlin. We don't want to talk about it. We think we can get through it, but it's, it's tough. About 12 o'clock, I uh, called up the German ambassador, a fellow named Greva, and uh, it was very clear that I got him out of bed about 11.30. And the lights were burning in the State Department. The lights were burning at the White House of an alleged Berlin crisis, and the German ambassador is calmly asleep. I came back to the office, I said, you know, not, not Berlin. Friday, October 19th. Friday was a, a tough day. Uh, he spoke in Cleveland, tremendous crowds, and he spoke at, uh, he visited Lincoln's tomb, and then we came into Chicago, and Daly and all the crowd. That night, Bobby Kennedy calls his brother in Chicago, asking him to return to the White House and the crisis. Saturday, October 20th. I'm having breakfast with the president. He called Admiral Berkeley, the White House physician, down to his suite. And about 10 minutes later, he called Pierre. And I arrived in the suite, and the president was sitting there uh, in his bathrobe. And he had this yellow pad in front of him, and he was writing on it. And uh, he hands me the pad, and the pad said 99.2 degrees temperature. Uh, doctor says, uh, the president must return to Washington for treatment. And he said, I want you to call a press conference and announce that because we're flying back to Washington. The president came out of the hotel with an overcoat and a hat on. I mean, he never wore a hat. And he all kind of bundled up. And um, I think if you saw him from outside, you had the impression that he maybe did have a flu. The president goes immediately to the White House. Secretary of State Dean Rusk is there. And when he walked into the room to join the rest of us, he looked around the table and said with a little smile, well, gentlemen, Today, we're going to earn our pay. He decided, on the recommendation of myself and Bob McNamara, Bobby Kennedy, and some others, to use the quarantine method to uh, blockade uh, offensive weapons coming into Cuba. An armada of U.S. naval cade line 500 miles from Cuba. Soviet bloc ships trying to cross the line would be stopped and searched for missile parts. On land that weekend, the military also is in Key West, Florida. A command post for a possible invasion of Cuba is being set up. Monroe County Commissioner Billy Freeman gets a late night phone call. The government wanted permission to build an observation tower at this airport. And uh, I had to get them to open up uh, to be able to get the materials out to come out here and uh, build this thing and I must admit it was about the fastest piece of construction I've ever seen done and uh, that was the first inkling and in, uh, something was going on most of us have no inkling that anything is afoot with the title mr. president you wondered no doubt just who it could be don't jump to conclusions it's not on Broadway think. a new Irving Berlin Broadway musical just... opens about a mythical White House, a mythical president, Robert Ryan, and a mythical first lady, Nanette Fabre.